Hey there, everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the 11th plateau of Jules Dida's and Félix Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. This is titled 1837 of the Refrain. In this plateau, they're going to be connecting a lot of themes surrounding nature and the cosmos, and they've given us a hint into their leanings so far when they said in One or Several Wolves, we can no longer even speak of distinct machines, only of types of interpenetrating multiplicities that at any given moment form a single machinic assemblage, the faceless figure of the libido. And the libido here is supposed to be a sort of driving force. This is treating change as a vector, and identity too as a vector, that things are always oriented towards some change. And they tell us in Becoming Intense, Becoming Animal, one does not conform to a model, one straddles the right horse. And the point here is to say that reality is not going to conform to these stable, enduring models like states. These, like state formations, these are artificial. These are things that we create. And in fact, nature itself is a sort of cosmic assemblage of sorts, but it's constantly breaking its own rules. And in a sense, nature itself is constantly straddling the right horse, so to speak finding different ways of organizing itself, and then breaking those rules, mutating, involuting, so to speak, as opposed to evolving. So in Of the Refrain, Deleuze and Guattari are going to try to connect these various themes to music and to art, and they're trying to get behind exactly how is nature creative, you may have been in nature before, and you look around and you see all sorts of different signs of order, like the seasons and uh, certain maybe territorial markers of birds that are on trees. But then we also see all sorts of intensive variations that don't conform to a model, but rather just fly, so to speak. We see strange knots in trees that we've never seen before that create a face out of a tree, a face which penetrates into our very being. And here, Deleuze and Guattari are trying to hint at different ways in which we can interact with territory, with repetition, with things that formalize themselves and come to be definable in a definite way. In the opening of the plateau, they open us up to three different instances, one of which is a child who's in the dark and he's gripped with fear, and he comforts himself by singing under his breath. In a sense, this is the way in which song is a way of confronting chaos, or sound is a way of ordering chaos. It uses the intensities as a background and puts over top of these intensities sound as a way of ordering it, giving it some sort of comfort, giving it a tonality or a home. And this is the beginning of an establishment of territory. We could think of culture as a sort of territory. It establishes a sort of home base out of a number of variable activities. It creates a sort of tonality rules of playing the game, rules of how you ought to act when you're talking to various people, and thus we have traditions and customs and proper mannerisms of speech and things like this, which form out of a number of very different ways of confronting chaos. In the second instance, they talk about a housewife who puts on the radio while doing her activities as a way of placing sonic bricks, so to speak. And this hints at the second type of force, which they call a terrestrial force, the previous one being forces of chaos. Here in terrestrial forces, we organize within an assemblage. We use variation and repetition in reference to some kind of model to give some organization to space. Here, sound acts as a proper method of action. 
one puts on classical music to put on a sort of air of aristocracy or of comfortability or of decadence and in this way imposes a further order on a territory which may already be ordered. And in this sense, we have not come from chaos to an assemblage, but rather within an assemblage, we've used song in order to continue to bolster up certain ways of acting within the assemblage. Now, the third thing that they bring us upon are the cosmic forces. These are passages and escapes via non-totalizable forces. They say that one opens the circle a crack, opens it all the way, lets someone in, calls someone, or else goes out oneself launching forth. One opens the circle, not on the side where the old forces of chaos press against it, but in another region, one created by the circle itself, as though the circle tended on its own to open onto a future, as a function of the working forces it shelters. One launches forth, hazards an improvisation, but to improvise is to join with the world or meld with it. One ventures from home on the thread of a tune. So here, in the cosmic forces, song is a way of escaping not by following some sort of pre-made axioms, but taking account of the forces that are keeping one compelled to act within a circle, so to speak, which is roughly analogous to their idea of territory, of this circle. But rather, one creates an opening in the circle which is prompted by the circle itself which is to say the territory is always going to break out of itself someplace. And thus, song has an interesting dialectic which it takes hold of, which is that it can be used to rein in chaos or let chaos free. And this is what they're talking about when they want us to don the right horse. They want us to um, use these lines of flight in order to create territory but not enough where territory becomes despotic, which is certainly a hard line to grasp and take hold of and take heed of. Picture you're going to bed and you hear rain outside your house, pitter-pattering against your windows, against your ceiling, and you start to focus on it and try to come up with different rhythmic patterns that it obeys. Maybe you try to imagine the rain tip-tapping to the beat of a song. But alas, you look hard and you only find these occasional rhythmic figures, little eighth notes, little motifs. But as soon as they become established in one's ear, nature immediately grasps these cosmic forces and uses them to tear a hole in any sort of meter or formalized sense of sound. And this is an important part of the way nature uses sound that Deleuze and Guattari want to take advantage of, because the rain does not obey any sense of structure necessarily. Sure, it will come and go, and it will obey certain relations of intensity, such as how hard is it raining, or how big are the water droplets, or what is the temperature of the water, which at a certain threshold will turn it into snow. So it does obey certain formal relations, but these are, of course, precisely relations. They incur their functional characteristics in relation to air pressure and the pH of the water and the concentration of nitrogen in the air and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is maybe going to prevent rain from being able to fall if it was uninhibited by CO2. And all of this is laying the groundwork for Deleuze and Guattari trying to make a distinction between meter and rhythm. For those who don't know, in music, we tend to formalize our music by meter, 
which is to say, we impose a formalized structure on our music which breaks it into measures, and these measures have a certain amount of beats per measure in relation to some sort of timekeeping technique, such as a metronome that will... And on its own, that little snapping doesn't mean anything. We don't know how we're going to divide that up. But when we divide up that rhythm, we turn it into meter. We turn it into a formalized length of time where there are three clicks per measure, four clicks per measure, two clicks per measure. In this way, we stratify rhythm. We cut it up and we turn it into a formalized structure. But if we go back to our example of the rain, we know that nature doesn't obey these sort of transcendental, formal characteristics. Nature isn't metered. It is simply rhythmic, which is to say, just like with the snapping, yes, sometimes it will follow from the previous snap in very definite ways and in the same length of time before and after any given snap, but nature ensures us that this moment of repetition is always fleeting. It is always a way of expressing nature's cosmic forces, but always in a way that is going to eventually go beyond any sense of pure repetition. As they say, meter is dogmatic, but rhythm is critical. It ties together critical moments, or ties itself together in passing from one milieu to the other. It does not operate in a homogeneous space-time but by heterogeneous blocks, it changes direction. And this is the thing that they find so persuasive about rhythm. And breaking down this idea of meter, which they're going to relate to music, in order to find a way to change direction. If you can imagine, there are several forces in one's life that are going to compel one to act a certain way. For example, I went to a Wendy's recently, and I was ordering food in the drive-thru and asked for a small drink. And the guy responded, it's going to come in medium. You okay with that? I was like, okay, sure. In this way, there is a habit being imposed on one by capitalism, by Wendy's as a corporation, by cultural norms in the U.S. where bigger is better. And it becomes out of the norm to deviate from these norms. So in this way, a direction is decided for one. One's libido, so to speak, one's drives, are decided by someone else. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a particular someone else. In fact, Deleuze and Guattari think that this is defined by a machinic assemblage. It has all sorts of variations and repetitions within it, which are going to define what exactly becomes a norm and what doesn't, what becomes sane and what becomes mad. In this way, Deleuze and Guattari see nature as a way out of being propelled by these forces or being demanded to act in a certain way, because nature's rules are precisely that it is constantly breaking its rules. And any rules that do establish any sense of repetition is always only in an effort to eventually change direction. As they say, a milieu does not in fact exist by virtue of a periodic repetition, but one whose only effect is to produce a difference by which the milieu passes into another milieu. It is the difference that is rhythmic, not the repetition, which nevertheless produces it. Productive repetition has nothing to do with reproductive meter. This is the critical solution of the antinomy. And what they're pointing out here between production and reproduction is to say something similar to what Jean Baudrillard says when he's talking about fashion as an industry. He speaks of fashion as a subtle way in which behaviors are encouraged onto oneself such that 
one is defined by a reproductive mode of being. One reproduces a model which has been given to one instead of doing as Deleuze and Guattari want to do and just don the right horse. So here they're making a distinction between reproduction and meter, something formalized, something imposed, versus productive repetition, which is to say rules that come about or repeated themes or motifs that come about but only in a productive process, which is eventually going to bypass them. And thus, it's not a question of stability, but rather it's a question of when is the flight going to come? When is this order going to be torn down? Throughout this, they're trying to define, okay, when is it exactly that something becomes expressive? They say there is a territory when the rhythm has expressiveness. What defines the territory is the emergence of matters of expression, qualities. So in a similar sense, like I talked about before, with the establishment of cultural norms, here, territory is defined by a sort of expressiveness. What is allowed to be expressed? What is allowed to come about? And thus, territory is always teetering on the edge of despotism, of imposing order and not letting things break free, and also allowing new lines of flight to come about by going against an order or by passing through an order, passing perpendicular instead of parallel, as Deleuze and Guattari put it throughout this work. Throughout this entire work, they've made a distinction between territory and territorialization, which is often something that you won't get until you really read close. But they give us a very specific definition of territory, not as a set formalized structure, but as something that is achieved through action, which is to say territorialization that zation part at the end implies an action, of course, grammatically speaking. They say the territory is not primary in relation to the qualitative mark, mark as in a mark on a territory. It is the mark that makes the territory. Functions in a territory are not primary. They presuppose a territory producing expressiveness. In this sense, the territory and the functions performed within it are products of territorialization. Territorialization is an act of rhythm that has become expressive, or of milieu components that have become qualitative. And to help understand exactly what they're saying here, we have to think of, for example, an animal who uses territorial behavior in order to mark out a territory. Something like a male dog that pees at certain spots in order to denote a territory. We must keep in mind that the territory, so to speak, insofar as it is just raw land, already existed before the dog was there to make it his territory. And there is a leap between the earth, between land, and it's being turned into territory. It's becoming qualitative, as they say. All these rhythmic intensities and these variations in the territory, where does a mountain go up or down? Where does the rain fall? Where are the caves? Where are the maximum resonance points where the wolf's howl will go the furthest? All of these are going to allow spaces for the wolf or the dog, to find places to establish territory. And the dog, for example, will do this by peeing in several spots. And they point out that the territory is not ready-made. These functions are not uh, primary, but rather they presuppose that the action will be expressive for, namely, establishing a territory. 
And what we mean here is that peeing in and of itself does not always entail establishing a territory. For example, one can pee in a toilet, and this doesn't necessarily mean you're marking off the toilet as your territory. Whereas if we compare this to the dog, we see that it is a veritable form of territorialization. It is an act which is geared toward, toward establishing territory. And the question is, well, why is peeing in a toilet for a human not a territorializing activity, but peeing for the dog, for particularly the male dog, is a territorializing activity? And the important thing here to note is that these aren't always going to act the same ways. Actions depend on their context. And Deleuze and Guattari say that it is the mark that makes the territory. Because the land is already there, what makes it a territory is an action which takes in swath of, swaths of land and says, you're mine now, I have encapsulated you, and turned you into a territorial apparatus for my purposes, and thus I can create functive capacities within here. In terms of expressiveness, they use an example of the colors of birds or fish. They say, color is a membrane state associated with interior hormonal states, but it remains functional and transitory as long as it is tied to a type of action sexuality, aggressiveness, flight. It becomes expressive, on the other hand, when it acquires a temporal constancy and a spatial range that make it a territorial or rather territorializing mark, a signature. Which is to say here that an action, when it enters on this sort of mode of flight and it becomes creative, it does so because it establishes a sort of constancy or regularity and a range within which it occur occurs. They highlight here from Conrad Lorenz, who is a famous uh, behavioral psychologist, their glorious dress is constant. The coloring of coral fish is distinguished in large, sharply contrasting areas of the body. This is quite different from the color patterns not only of most freshwater fish, but of nearly all less aggressive and less territorial fish. Like the colors of the coral fish, the song of the nightingale sings from a distance to all members of its species that a territory has found an owner. So they're pointing out that the colors of fish, or the song of a nightingale, can all engage in this expressiveness which comes to indicate a territory. And their question here throughout is exactly how do these chaotic forces get established and formalized and become expressive? How do they get incorporated and change from just matter-of-fact behaviors to expressive behaviors which indicate that they are a territorializing function? They're careful to not establish these behaviors in relation to any definite territory or pre-formulated territory. As they say, these have become expressive because they are territorializing. Again, ing at the end of that word is signaling that this is an ongoing action. As they say, expressive qualities, the colors of the coral fish, for example, are auto-objective. In other words, find an objectivity in the territory they draw. And it's important to mention here that they're using their distinction before between tracing and drawing, where tracing is following a pre-formulated stencil or model, whereas drawing is like mapping. You're being a cartographer, creating your own map, so to speak. So here, territorialization is not linked to any specific territory, but rather to the way it engulfs, to the way it interacts with material that is already there. And thus, territorialization is defined in the way it interacts, not in the way in which it signals. Because this is assuming that 
these behaviors signify something in advance. But they don't signify something in advance. They come to have a function in the objectivity that we find through the territory that they draw, the active process that they engage in. This plateau carries a striking dissimilarity to the previous plateau, which is becoming intense, becoming animal, becoming imperceptible, where the focus is on becoming. The focus is on using animals as a way to draw a line of flight, to escape territory. Whereas here, they're focusing mostly on repetition and on territory, on rhythmic constancy and regularity. And this might strike one as contradictory. It sometimes may strike one as if they want to get rid of territory or form. And at other times, it seems like they depend on it. And I think it's very important to note that they do not get rid of territory. They don't want us to enter a sort of, I've heard it called like tentacle philosophy before, where, oh, just abandon everything, just go schizo, go crazy, abandon all forms and just act like tentacles and be creative. Deleuze and Guattari think that this sort of mentality is going to draw an abstract line of death, which is to say it is going to propel one to an idiotic and nihilistic death. We need territory. We need culture as a background upon which to create new motifs and new themes and new rhythmic ways of interacting and territorializing. And they've mentioned throughout the importance on deterritorialization, but have also been careful to let us know that deterritorialization requires territory to be deterritorialized. It requires something upon which to act. And their way out of this dialectic between change and constancy is precisely by figuring out how do characteristics have a differential relation? How are they defined not by being static, but as a mode of action? And thus, they here herald the nomad, which they're going to go on to talk about later in A Thousand Plateaus. They say how very important it is when chaos threatens us to draw an inflatable, portable territory. If need be, I'll put my territory on my own body. I'll territorialize my body. The house of the tortoise, the hermitage of the crab, but also tattoos that make the body a territory. Critical distance is not a meter. It is a rhythm. But the rhythm, precisely, is caught up in a becoming that sweeps up the distances between characters, making them rhythmic characters that are themselves more or less distant, more or less combinable, intervals. Two animals of the same sex and species confront each other. The rhythm of the first one expands when it approaches its territory, or the center of its territory. The rhythm of the second contracts when it moves away from its territory. Between the two, at the boundaries, an oscillational constant is established. An active rhythm, a passively endured rhythm, and a witness rhythm. And it's important to note here their insistence upon this idea of an oscillational constant. We can think of this as a way of being which is going to focus on territory as only ever being fleeting and distant. In Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche speaks of man as a rope stretched between the animal and the übermensch. And he says what is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a goal. Which is to say that Nietzsche, too, views man as this oscillational constant. This is kind of an early heralding of the nomad that Deleuze and Guattari will focus on. That if we want to live in a life-affirming way, if we want to establish creative practices, we have to build this portable territory which always has a differential relation that's involved in a process of becoming 
and is defined by any sort of territory being an oscillational constant. Which, when we think about those two words next to each other, oscillational constant, it's almost a contradiction in terms, similar to in calculus when we speak of the differential as an instantaneous rate of change. But this is exactly what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to talk about. They want to insist on the fact that every instantaneous moment is defined by a rate of change a speed of deterritorialization, as they've called it, an oscillational constancy in which every constant, every form, every rhythm, every refrain is defined by a speed of oscillation. And it is our job as creators to latch on to these moments of oscillation, find our speeds of territorialization, know our faces, as they say in the faciality plateau, Throughout this plateau, Deleuze and Guattari always maintain a relationship to the sociology of religion and rites and cultic practices, and they invoke Mircea Eliade throughout here to talk about how does this relate to the establishment of religion or cultural practices or formalized ways of interacting socially. And they point out that the territory groups all the forces of the different milieus together in a single sheaf constituted by the forces of the earth. And this is, of course, pretty self-explanatory. The earth is the place upon which all of our different territories are instantiated upon. And thus, the earth is the pure background. And not in a negative way, where it's just a mere background, but it is the background. It is the place from which the cosmic springs forth. And thus, they always maintain a relation to the earth where they speak of it as a dimension of depth, where the two types of force clasp and are wed in a battle whose only criterion and stakes is the earth. So the earth is similar to Hegel's talking in his master-slave dialectic about this fight for life and death over recognition. How does a practice get formalized and recognized by a society or by a group? How does a territory get recognized? How does an individual's gender identity, sexual identity, practices, rituals, how do all of these get formalized and established and recognized? And Deleuze and Guattari, similar to Hegel, point out that indeed this is a battle and it's taking place upon the earth. But they don't think that this is a hopeless battle unless we want to see it that way. They point out here the great potential that can come from the earth, which is very similar to how Nietzsche speaks of the sun at the beginning of Zarathustra's prologue in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. He speaks of the sun and says, You great star, what would your happiness be if you had not those for whom you shine? Which indicates a social relationship between nature and all the beings which inhabit it. And later goes on to continue saying, Bless me then, you tranquil eye that can behold even an all too great happiness without envy. Which is to say that nature also portrays a sort of indifference, but indifference in a good way, where it can endure any atrocity that hits it, and once again, a process of ecological succession will happen. A volcano will erupt over a land and all the grass and everything will be destroyed. But this acts as a fertilizing method that allows for primary, secondary, tertiary succession to occur, where we have mosses that establish and make the soil become rich enough to allow for small fauna, and then we have the possibility for animals to come and inhabit the area. And thus there's kind of this continual recurrent process that happens through intensive difference. And thus, Deleuze and Guattari think that this is an 
an incredibly creative process because territory is naturally going to get raised to the ground. It's going to be raised asunder. They state, the earth is this close embrace. This intense center is simultaneously inside the territory and outside several territories that converge on it at the end of an immense pilgrimage, hence the ambiguities of the natal. Inside or out, the territory is linked to this intense center, which is like the unknown homeland, terrestrial source of all forces, friendly and hostile, where everything is decided. And when they speak about the natal, this might be a particularly confusing topic, but they've actually touched on it in Antiedipus when they talk about being immediately atheist, immediately orphan, which is to speak of a state in which things have not yet been decided. They talk about in the how do you make yourselves a body without organs plateau, they have this picture of an egg with all these dotted lines drawn across the egg. And this is in reference to findings in biology, particularly in embryology, that found, and this is also, of course, a a supporting fact about evolution by natural selection as a legitimate biological reality. In an early embryonic stage, when something is in an egg or in a womb and it hasn't yet established, it has no discernible form for a good bit of time. And as it does establish a form, you will have all sorts of different embryos from a vast number of different organisms all of which look very similar to one another. And only later do they establish these divergences. And thus, we can see in the early stages of embryonic development, the earlier we go, all the way back to the very beginning of kind of the egg, at this moment, the egg has not yet been decided. It is in this state where it is, as they speak, the ambiguity of the natal. Things have not yet formed, and there is this bubbling creativity that is allowed to happen. And all sorts of different mutations can occur, defects, or merely variations would be a better way to think about it, which is going to allow for territory to be established, for an intensive center of pure difference, which is the egg, to spring forth and give us forces, friendly and hostile, and yield a space where everything is decided. And thus, the earth is really the natal itself. Th this is the ending of 2001 A Space Odyssey, where we see a baby who hasn't yet been birthed inside of a womb, and we see it in a fetal position, and it's glowing, looking atop the earth. The point that is being made here is that the earth is the infant, in a sense. That it is this springer of possibilities and, oh, how is, you know, this relates to space travel and the future of humanity. All this different stuff that 2001 is trying to talk about is very similar to what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to talk about when they mention the excitement that we can gain from the creativity that nature will engage in with this dialectic between forces, which isn't necessarily pre-formulated. This is an important part of nature, is it's not going to follow these formalized rules. And if it does, it's not going to be for very long. And it's always going to be in a process of bypassing these rules. We might look at some sort of piece of territory below a mountain, and we'll be like, oh, this is a great place to make our home. And then a volcano explodes and kills everyone. And it's just, it's exactly the sort of, sort of rhythmic motif of nature's eternal recurrence in which there is no territory. There is only intensive difference. To summarily explain exactly what the refrain is, they mention on page 323, in a general sense, we call a refrain any aggregate of matters of expression that draws a territory and develops into territorial motifs and landscapes 
There are optical, gestural, motor, etc. refrains. In the narrow sense, we speak of a refrain when an assemblage is sonorous or dominated by sound. And it's important to note what exactly is the refrain? What is a refrain in general? This whole plateau is called of the refrain, but I still haven't told you what it is, and maybe you might be thinking, well, this didn't really help either. A refrain is a repeated pattern in music that sort of acts as the formalized structure. It's like the chorus or the hook of a song. It acts as that repetitious passage which gives a formalized AABB or ABCBA structure to music. This is how we can talk about like sonata form in allegro form and different forms of music precisely by focusing, okay, where is the refrain? Where is the repeating segments of this piece of music? And thus, where has the territory been established? But Deleuze and Guattari point out throughout this plateau that the refrain is terribly useful because, well, we might think it's just pure reproduction, so to speak, that it's just reproducing the same theme over and over, and it's trying to impose order on the world. But they point out that the refrain is always a little bit different every time it comes around. If we think about the way in which we experience music, think about listening to a piece of music for the first time, and you come upon the refrain, there's a refrain in there. There's a refrain that happens twice, but each time it's followed by something different. It is put into variation. It is used as a point of reference, or as they call it, a component of passage. The refrain is never exactly the same because its context is never exactly the same. And as you go through listening to this piece of music, each time you run into the refrain, you have in your mind, okay, this has happened once before, or this has happened twice before. And that is a fundamentally different experience. This refrain, the third time it's happened, is fundamentally different from the first time it has happened. Even if the melodic content is exactly the same, the fact that its context has varied has turned it into a completely unique affect in which the refrain is always a site of possibility. It's always a component of passage, a sort of tool by which to draw a line of flight, by which to map an escape, but an escape not in the sense of escaping form, or structure, but rather a way at twisting and stretching the form and expressing your agency on that musical motif. And thus, a refrain is an aggregate of matters of expression, which is to say it's a number of elements which have an expressive capability. They express some kind of sound or affect. And it draws a territory which is to say it is an active process of establishing a feeling or a home base. And it develops into territorial motifs and landscapes, which is to say it is always in the active process of establishing these musical landscapes. And thus, it's really interesting to think about soundscapes, which is a sort of style of music in which you use all these different like little percussion instruments, little whistles and wind chimes and wind sticks and flutes and bird collars in order to create a sort of landscape of sound. And it's defined by this sort of free-form nature. And when you listen to it, you get a sense that it's always 
following these new meandering lines. It's not formalized. There is no soundscape form, but rather a soundscape is just, oh, there's a bird chirp here or there's wind here. Now, sometimes when someone is making a soundscape, they will loop a sound. They will use an electronic capability in order, for example, if they're performing it live, to loop that sound such that they can continue on playing some other instrument. And thus, that repetition becomes a refrain. It becomes a point of reference where we start to feel at home. But instantly, this refrain, at the point of a bird chirp or a flute call, becomes fundamentally different. It acts as a cosmic backdrop, so to speak, on which other forces instantiate themselves, and where creativity can happen, where there's a backdrop to create counterpoint, as they say. And counterpoint in music is the relation between two or more lines. Oftentimes, this results in polyphony or polyphonic music, which is defined by all these different kinds of centers of territory. These different tonalities and key centers and all these different motifs interacting on top of one another, vertically. And by happening on top of one another, there's all these relations to different key centers. We're playing in G and C and D at the same time, and there's a relationship that occurs by doing that. And thus, they want to connect this to a concrete example and they take the Troglodytite, the Wren family. They say, the male takes possession of his territory and produces a music box refrain as a warning to possible intruders. He builds his own nests in his territory, sometimes as many as a dozen. When a female arrives, he sits in front of a nest, invites her to visit, hangs his wings, and lowers the intensity of his song, reduced to a mere trill. It seems that the nesting function is highly territorialized, since the nests are prepared by the male alone before the arrival of the female, who only visits and completes them. The courtship function is also territorialized, but to a lesser degree, since the territorial refrain becomes seductive by changing in intensity. So here, in the uh, context of the troglodytite, they point out that they have this mating function in which the male prepares all these different nests and he has this motif or this refrain that he signals. And it changes in response to the female and they enter into a communion which is going to cause this refrain to change in intensity. And it's important to note that this sound that is made by the wren, it is both a way of warding off predators, in which case it is a territorial function. It symbolizes, this is my territory. These are my nests and don't come near them. But when in conjugation with a female, the refrain changes intensity. It becomes a mere trill. And in this case, it turns into a courtship function. And thus, here, the troglodytite have engaged in a process in which the refrain becomes something else. It becomes a method by which the male and the female engage in courtship. And thus, this is a creative process in which a repetitious activity like this territorial music box refrain that is a territorial warning changes in relation to something else and becomes. And thus, the territorialized functions, they require this dichotomy between the territory and what's not, the home and the outside. And it's regulated by this constant process of becoming qua change in intensity. And thus, becoming is always inherent in an order. There is always this potential for some 
practice to enter a conjugal relation with another practice and to fundamentally change the expressiveness of something. This refrain that the troglodytite use turns from a territorial refrain, its expressiveness turns from a warning to a symbol of matrimony, almost. A conjugation between these two beings into one collective assemblage together. And thus, this is one relation in which becoming is actuated via valence. Valence is a word they use, and this is a term that they take from chemistry. In chemistry, any element, for example, carbon, has a valence, which is to say it has a combinatory power. It has, for example, a number of atoms that can come into conjugation with it, or that it can hold in its orbitals. And thus, it has a definite amount of combinatory power, a definite amount of ways in which it can interact with other things. And thus, the valence of something is always kind of this, this threshold of interaction that it can have. So every practice, for example, the refrain of the troglodytite, at first acts as a warning call, but it has a valence, it has a range of expressivity. And when that valence reaches a certain threshold, it is now a call of courtship. It is a moment of matrimony. And thus, everything is defined by a sort of range in which it works. This is like a range of tolerance in biology, where an organism has a range of pH or pressure in which it can healthily survive, but if the pH gets too high, an organism, like especially like a, a microorganism, it will just denature. Its boundary or its membrane that keeps it intact will just fall apart. And thus everything has a valence, even practices like territorializing practices. And thus territory is defined by a range which is constantly defined by am I interacting with a predator, am I interacting with a female, or a totally open set of possibilities of what could this thing interact with? How is that going to change the refrain? And thus we can see the inkling of the ways in which these refrains are going to act as a component of passage. These are going to act as a formal element which is going to allow change to come about. It's going to act as a backdrop upon which veritable change can occur. Now, throughout this plateau, they've highlighted an ambiguity. That is an ambiguity between territory and deterritorialization, between form and its dissolution, between structure and the chaos that pushes that structure away. And their concern, exactly, is... How can we look at nature and witness the natal, so to speak, which, like we've mentioned before, this is like the unformed egg. It's that which is awaiting possibility, which is ready for change. And they point out a number of what they call prodigious takeoffs from the territory, displaying a vast movement of deterritorialization directly plugged into the territories and permeating them through and through. So these are a number of different things that they see in nature in which just a takeoff occurs, a creative process occurs. They mention pilgrimages to the source as among salmon. The second is supernumerary assemblages, such as those of locusts or chaffinches. They speak of these tens of millions of chaffinches that come into these colonies. Or, I mean, think about tales of locusts in the Bible. And third, they speak of magnetic or solar-guided migrations. And the fourth, which is an interesting one, are long marches such as those of lobsters. 
And they take this from The March of the Lobsters, commentary by Chasteau Diolet. And they say, spiny lobsters along the northern coast of the Yucatan Peninsula sometimes leave their territories. They assemble, at first in small groups, before the first winter storm and before any sign detectable by human instruments. When the storm comes, they form long march processions in single file with a leader that is periodically relieved and rear guarded. The speed of the march is five-eighths of a mile per hour for 60 miles or more. This migration does not seem to be associated with egg laying, which does not take place until six months later. The factual issue is that in this exceptional case, the lobster's territorial assemblage opens onto a social assemblage, and that this social assemblage is connected to cosmic forces, or, as Cousteau says, pulsations of the earth. And this is going to hint at the cosmic forces, or the forces of change or deterritorialization that are in nature. The places where it abandons its territory, and seemingly by magic, these lobsters assemble into these large groups and they just march. For 60 miles or more, they march single file, and they do this thing kind of like bird migration, where they migrate in this reverse V pattern. And there's always a bird at the tip. And you might think, oh, this is super hierarchical, like there's always one leader. But the leader bird is always swapped out with another bird. And thus the leader or the concrete hierarchical structure of this assemblage is always in flux. It's always being changed and opposed as a new leader comes and takes place. And thus, it doesn't even seem like the lobsters do this for a particular purpose. They, why would they do this six months in advance? Now we could say that maybe this is just a bit of incredulity of looking at a practice we don't understand and saying that like it just must be magic. But Deleuze and Guattari aren't trying to say it's magic. Their whole point here is that the earth is constantly betraying any rules. They say it is no longer adequate to say that there is intra-assemblage, passage from a territorial assemblage to another type of assemblage. Rather, we should say that one leaves all assemblages behind, that one exceeds the capacities of any possible assemblage entering another plane. In effect, there is no longer a milieu movement or rhythm, nor a territorialized or territorializing movement or rhythm. There is something of the cosmos in these more ample movements. The localization mechanisms are still extremely precise, but the localization has become cosmic. These are no longer territorialized forces bundled together as forces of the earth. They are the liberated or regained forces of a deterritorialized cosmos. And this figure of the cosmos is basically the body without organs that they've talked about before, or the plane of consistency, or the egg, the cosmic egg. They'll use those terms in conjugation several times. And they're not positing a separate metaphysical plane. They're not saying that the lobsters transcend to some some plane of the cosmos. No. They're using a very metaphorical way to talk about this instance of change, of creativity, and that, for example, with the lobsters, it's not reducible to, oh, they're trying to mate, or there's some sort of hormonal force acting upon them. We can't even sense the mechanism by which this occurs. It's merely a moment in which the earth and nature shows itself to be a creative agent. And thus, they will continue to connect these themes of repetition and the refrain to serving as a possibility for difference, for creativity, for change. And they'll use this as a way to talk about how can artists take advantage of this dialectic between territory and deterritorialization, between stability and chaos between form and the cosmos.
I hope this has been helpful and given you some thoughts on Deleuze and Guattari. I hope that you'll maybe consider reading A Thousand Plateaus and that you'll check out any of my other lectures if anything was unclear or if you want to see any of the lectures I've done on any of the other 10 plateaus of A Thousand Plateaus so far. Leave any constructive or non-constructive criticism in the comments and I'll see you in another lecture.